Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Cafe Con Tampa Online. I'm Bill Carlson. Hand off to my colleague Della Costa to introduce our speaker. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Cafe Con Tampa. We wish you a healthy and safe Labor Day weekend. Uh, our guest speaker today is Akash Patel. He's chair of the Early Learning Coalition of Hillsborough County. Uh, Akash is going to hook us with the title of his topic today, Bosses for Babies. Akash, tell us what the title means. What is Bosses for Babies? Well, good morning, Dell. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Bill. I want to just uh, give a real quick shout out to uh, the Children's Movement of Florida and the Early Learning Coalition of Hillsborough County for, for, uh, for allowing me to speak today. Um, the Children's Movement of Florida started this initiative called Bosses for Babies, Dell, to answer your question. And it's an initiative that helps bring together champions for early childhood and, and bring, you seem basically bringing together business leaders to talk and advocate for the importance of child care in our nation. And tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, I, I own a business here in Tampa. I've been in Tampa for 14 years. Bill Carlson was my first boss. So you can blame him or thank him, either one, Dell. And um, I, uh, my business is called Elevate Inc. And we are a consulting firm that helps companies uh, with their social media and community outreach. I think actually Paul Tash or somebody at the Times was your first boss, right? In Tallahassee. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but Akash is involved in a lot of things in the community. You just got on the executive committee of Leadership Tampa Bay. Uh, what else are you involved in? I'm on the board of the Indo U.S. Chamber as well, as, as well as the past chair of the Center Club and the past chair of the University of Tampa Board of Counselors. Great. We want before the end, we want to come back to the Indo U.S. Chamber. Um, uh, t tell us more about the Early Learning Coalition and what it does. Yeah. So the Early Learning Coalition was founded in the year 2000. It was created by the legislature under Governor Bush. And we are we oversee basically our the providers in Hillsborough County, the child care daycare centers, and we have uh, uh, 700 or so providers that um, get get you know they 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 service what we call VPK. So everything, I mean, the best way to put a bill is we're the school boards for early learning, anything zero through four. So we, VPK and school readiness, and we have uh, so many coalitions around the state. We have 30 coalitions. Hillsborough happens to have its own coalition. Every county doesn't have their own but the coalition itself has about 110 employees. We're located off at Interstate Commerce Center. We've been around, like I said, for nearly 20 years. We have a budget of over a little bit over $100 million. And um, our CEO, you, you might know, is Gordon Gillette. He's the former CEO of Tico. And he, we brought him on in 2018. I was first appointed as chair in 2014. And I can tell you, Bill, it's been a, it's been a, it's been a great process to learn about what the Early Learning Coalition does and how much it impacts not only just children, but families in Hillsborough County. And what are some of the projects that you're working on now or new initiatives? One of the initiatives the coalition just completed, Dell, is of course during the pandemic, these child care centers are small businesses. They, um, they, you know, this, this was a major crisis for them because they depend on the children and depend on the income to survive. And so we surveyed all of our providers at the county. We, like I said, we have about you know, a total of about 1,300 different providers, but uh, um, because we include like what we call family, uh, family child licensed care, uh, care centers. But we surveyed all of our providers. It's a board led initiative. We, we surveyed all of our providers and we said, what do you need to open back up when the pandemic clears up? And they needed thermometers and they needed, you know, masks, they needed gloves, they needed extra paper goods, right? So we said, you know, what can we do at the coalition to help? And so we reached out to the business community and we raised funds and we created a supply drive. And so we purchased uh, bags worth about $115 worth of materials. And we just recently, about a few weeks ago, handed those bags out. Each provider center uh, received one. And um, that's an initiative we're really proud of because, again, these childhood centers have really suffered during this pandemic. And when you talk about bosses for babies in the children's movement, an important stat to remember is 67% of children under six both have parents in the workforce. So the children movement advocates, and just like the Early Learning Coalition, we want high quality education and access to children, uh, access to children, healthcare, and, and great support in Florida. So Bill knows the Florida Chamber of Commerce, they have an Early Learning Coalition, or Early Learning Business Alliance. And so I think together the children movement and the Business Alliance and all the coalitions are just wanting to start the conversation about the importance of childcare in this nation and in the state, sorry. Gosh, let me ask you a, 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 a short question from the floor and then a big question. Um, you briefly mentioned Bosses for Babies. Can you tell us more about that? And then also the question from the floor is, Is Head Start? how is Head Start related to the Early Learning Coalition? 
I'll answer the second part first. Head Start is one of the programs we we do uh, we do uh, assist with. It's one of the after school programs that for Hillsborough County. In fact, the head of Head Start's on our board, Dr. Jacqueline Jenkins. Um, as far as what bosses for babies is, Bill, um, business leaders basically, if they want to join, they can reach out to me. They can reach out to the coalition. They can reach out to the children's movement. But we need business leaders to start the conversation, right? So be vocal about early learning. Volunteer. I mean, obviously donations are great, but we know there's a lot of things to donate to right now. Advocate. You know, we talk about Tallahassee, Bill. You mentioned that earlier uh, when your son, you said your son's a seminal. I'm a seminal, by the way. And um, congrats to him by going to, for going there. But advocating in Tallahassee is so important, right? So um, there's a lot of policies that are going to happen in Tallahassee this legislative session, probably for the ne near foreseeable future, that's going to affect the VPK program. Does the Early Childhood Coalition have any programs for special children who need special education needs? We, have, we, we, we do support those, the Early Learning Coalition in Hillsborough County, we do support those centers and those programs, but mainly what we're, what we're talking about is VPK. So we're, we're, we're basically the administrator for, the first, for servicing VPK to Hillsborough County. And uh, Akash, a couple years ago, we had at Capping on Table, we were meeting at Oxford still, hopefully we'll be there again soon. Um, we had you and Bob using different political parties. And so this really uh, early learning is a, is, is a nonpartisan issue. It seems that there is agreement on both sides of the aisle where there's very little agreement these days. Could you speak to that? And are there any differences along uh, political ideological lines? Yeah, great question. I mean, I think for, we're talking about society. To build a better society, it starts with early learning. The, the ROI for business people, Bill, is every dollar you invest in early learning, you get $8 back. So fundamentally, you talk about different parties, everyone wants a better society for, for all quality of life. And so, no, I don't believe there's any disparaging uh, issues between parties for early learning uh, advocacy. I think what, you know, what happens in, in Tallahassee and in, in, you know, in Congress is there's just other things that are prioritized. But as far as the fundamental belief that early learning and the investment of early learning is important. Everyone agrees that we, you know, for, for, for quality of life, for your, for your, you know, you're a parent and you know how much, I mean, think about how, how much, you know, I'm sure childcare impacted your life. So if, if we don't support early learning, a lot of these childcare centers will not survive. Uh, I think everybody understands uh, or assumes most childcare centers are babysitting centers. Can you ex uh, expand on how the difference between a babysitting center is and an early childhood education is? Yeah, curriculum. I mean, we talk about reading. We talk about, you know, just the fundamentals of social interactions. We talk about building blocks. We talk about all the things that you, it's a curriculum, right? So I, I don't know about, I don't, I don't know about babysitting services, but I, I don't know if there's a strict guidelines on curriculum. And um, I think, what, Akash, you mentioned you mentioned Tallahassee. What what are some of the the big proposals coming up before uh, the legislature in Tallahassee this next session? Well, every year, just you know, it come, because we're legislative, uh, because the coalitions are legislatively uh, created, every year generally comes up is what is the reimbursement rate per child for VPK, and you know every year it changes, but depending on who the governor is, depending on who the, you know the speaker is, what their priorities are. But I think just to give you an idea. In 2008, Bill, we were about $3,200 in reimbursement per child in Florida. In 2019, we we're about 2,300. So, you know, what I think is needed, and I hope, you know, the bosses for babies and a lot of advocacy organizations, as you can imagine, we, we, we need more inv investment in our early, early childhood VPK programs. And I think, you know, whether it's this session or next session, I do hope that we, we get the reimbursement rates back up. Massachusetts, to give you an example, is fifteen thousand dollars per student. Is demand greater than the supply, or or is there a discrepancy there? Yeah, great question. For Hillsborough County, there are a lot of uh, there's a wait list. There's a wait list, um, as in most coalitions, are wait lists. But I think it's the areas, right? There's some areas in town that have more uh, childhood care centers than others, and I think that you know part of this is hopefully other parts of town because again, remember we're talking about some folks that you know are like on the bus, you know, they're single families, and they take the bus, and they, they're they're different income levels. So I would say that that there there is definitely a need for more childcare centers in parts of the county that are you know that are that don't have that that 
service zone. What about and, the rural areas of the county agricultural families? How do you all handle those programs? Yeah, there are some like, you know, why mama silver space, I mean, all over, but we just, we, we'd always need one. And what do you think, you said you've been chair like four or five, six years now. Um, yeah. What what have you, what I, new ideas, innovations have you brought to the Early Learning Coalition since you've been there? Yeah, so one of the things is we kind of, kind of focus on a vision and a mission. We, we rebranded. We've moved our offices actually twice. Like I said, I brought in a, a business person who understands the workforce, Gordon Gillette. You know, he, he's not only was a former CEO of Tico, he also formerly chaired the Tampa Bay Economic Development Corporation. Um, and and we, we are basically implementing and brought in, uh, brought in some more private sector support. We also have started promoting what we call CCEP grants, which is businesses, um, and actually started, Bill, with CafeCon when we were there. And Blake Casper, of course, who owns Doctor Exchange, was in the room. Casper's company was the first to come on board. So I guess the answer to your question is we've kind of opened the dialogue, reach out to the community and, and ask business leaders to support our organization. We have a PNC bank, Diane Jacobs on our board. They've been a great supporter, not only in Tampa, but throughout the state, leading this Bosses for Babies program. On our board, we have a, a, a gentleman named Lee Bowers I brought on from WellCare is now Centene. Again, another corporate leader in the community that's, that serves the same population we do. And um, just more structure. Uh, we have governance committee now. We have a finance committee now. We have a strategic planning vision and mission and retreat. So I think you know when I took this leadership role on, Bill, um, when I came to the coalition six years ago, uh, I can tell you that there was just a lot of um, complacency because the same CEO had been there for 15 years, and there's it is what it is, right? So I just kind of uh, kind of revamped and reshaped and, and treated it like a business, which I you know I believe that you know, early learning is a business. How can business leaders get involved? Uh, so you've mentioned a number of them, but let's say there's somebody out there listening and he's got a small business. Is there involvement for somebody like that? Absolutely. They can call the Early Learning Coalition and ask for Allison Frager, our Director of Resource Development. And they can also go on the Children's Movement website or they can go on the bossesforbabies.com website. My thinking, Adele, is I have a small business. I have five employees, right? So I'm a small business owner, but the mission is greater than the, the business. The mission is we have to talk about building a better workforce. We have to talk about educational outcomes and we have to talk about quality access to education. And everyone has their own story about education. So if you're a small business or a big business or you know a for-profit or nonprofit, everyone has their own story. And I wanna make sure, and the coalitions and bosses for babies, they wanna share those stories to inspire others. So um, some other factors that, that impact uh, early success are health access to healthcare, transportation, um, income level, uh, housing, um, uh, other similar issues. Uh, how does the Early Learning Coalition uh, connect with other service providers that, that work on those issues? We don't have a transportation issue here, Bill, we're good. <laughs> now, uh, early learning, I think it impacts uh, the, 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 I mean, remember school districts, right? I mean, the first, one of the first few questions, you're right, you ask, you, if you're moving your company here, we're, we're getting a relocated company. You're going to ask about public transportation, but you're also going to ask about schools and the early learning. If you got, you know, a toddler and you're going to put them through VPK, they want to make sure they're in a good feeder system to whatever school they go to, and that's the fundamental. It's all about reading. The first, the first few years of your of your life, the first five years is when the brain is 90% developed. So, I would say that it's a huge impact, and especially because when we talk about Florida and the quality of life, you know, the access for education is a very important. You kind of touched on it already, but uh, what has been the impact of COVID-19 on uh, early childhood education? Uh, it's been tough on some child care provider centers that I've met with. I actually visited one with Superintendent Davis, a monastery school actually in Apollo Beach, uh, right around when the pandemic started opening up. Some of these private you know, child care centers were able to get the PPP loans, right? Some of them um, did not. And so they had to put personal money in, right? Because the children were not coming to their facility. So it's it's really tough. Um, they were, there were some child care centers that were, were able to deliver snacks to the homes every day, even though they weren't coming in. So they kept that interaction. And then also the social aspect of it. I mean, <clears throat> the after impact Dell, we're back in school now. And think about telling a three or four year old that they need to socially distance from their friends and where they're building blocks or they got to wear a mask or, you know, or they have to eat snacks with gloves on. There's a lot of uh, ramifications that we're seeing, but 
you know, as far as I've heard so far from talking to many child care uh, center providers that, that work with us at the coalition, and we have a, a couple on the board as well, um, you know, things are running smoothly. But during those COVID-19 months that we're talking about, Dell, it was tough for a lot of the providers because we've had crisis before, just like hurricanes. We've had to shut down and things like that, but you know, nothing like, you know, 30 days, 40 days, 60 days. Um, just a quick ad for Catholic on Tampa. If you're, thank you all for watching. If you're watching live or even if you're not, please hit the share button and the like button uh, so that your friends can see it. We do this as a service for the community because we want people to have access to information. And uh, also, if you're watching on YouTube, please uh, click the like button and click the subscribe button. Um, and if you haven't already, uh, please post a question underneath the feed uh, where this is playing or to the right of it, depending on how you're watching it. Shout out to our board members, one of whom uh, just asked a question. Uh, uh, PJ Somerville is our uh, Catholic on Tampa president. And her question is, how many early learning sites are in the city of Tampa? City of Tampa, that I, I don't know exactly the number, but throughout the county, we have, we have 1,300. 1,300, great. And what's the average size of one of these centers? So about seven, oh, sorry, six, uh, 700 or less than six students. So their family, child, and then the other ones are just majority or much bigger, like 30, 40, 50, 60, to even 100. So you kind of explained, there's probably like three categories the ones that are a family center, then a mid-size and the larger ones. Could you kind of explain how they operate and how you oversee them? Because that's a large number of facilities. Yeah, well, we oversee, you know, so basically they're, they're different age levels and they, and so it's the reimbursement and the, the uh, that we we provide. So you've got, you know, your infant, some, a lot of them have infants and some have, you know, the two, the three, and it's, it's about the class, the class teachers, to be honest with you, it's, you know, they have to have a certain amount of teachers to student ratio. And so when you talk about mid-size, it's you know, probably um, maybe four or five rooms. If you talk about a, a larger one, it might be six rooms, but they have multiple classes of those great, of those ages, not grades, but, and then there's, there's a few that have these infant centers that are you know, just toddlers that are like brand new babies. But um, as far as the, um, the, the, the inspection and the, and the re, you know, the reimbursement and the overseeing and the accreditation, that's what the board oversees. And so we have 21 board, or sorry, 22 board members and 13 of them are public uh, officials, basically they're appointed to those seats and the rest are private sector. And so one of the things, Bill, I guess back to your question is I wanted to increase the private sector participation on our board because at the same time when we're talking about all the struggles of COVID-19 Dell, you know, the public, you know, public uh, government officials have, have had, you know, setbacks in a lot of different agencies. And so we know that we need more increase more private sector involvement and that's why partnering with the children's movement for bosses for babies has been such a, a blessing for us akash i want to pivot for a second um talk about some things that probably people who know you would want to talk about while we're on here um, one of them is you're known as a master networker um, in tampa you and ron weaver are known as the, the two best networkers and you both have different styles um, can you tell us um, and tell the public like what are your tips for networking um, how are you so good at it? And, and how has that changed during COVID-19? How are you networking when people aren't going to meetings? Yeah, great question. And um, I think, I think number one, <clears throat> everyone has their own style. For me, it's just asking questions and then following up. I always like to, uh, my number one tip is every time I meet somebody, you know, I follow up with the regular email, but I also put their name in an Excel sheet. And then I pull up that Excel sheet once a month and I send another note just to touch base with them. Even if we've already had a call, I'll schedule it. Um, my, my one of my favorite books is called Never Eat Alone, and it's Colin how I learned the strategies of networking. Uh, basically, the Keith Frazzi wrote a book about you know, every time you're having a coffee, lunch, dinner, if you're in another city, call someone. Uh, I'm going, you know, just set up a chat for 30 minutes just to stay in touch, ask them how they're doing, how, how our families are, how the kids are, just like you earlier. We talked about your, your son out of Florida State, and then I, I would say during COVID 19, you know, my goal, I would say my goal during the week is to to reach out to 50 people. Um, this is when the pandemic was, was not going on. When the pandemic hit, I, re I started reaching out to about 20 people, but I started doing it through LinkedIn and just connecting and say, hey, um, I know things are tough. What can I do? How are you doing? Let's have a phone call. The amount of people I reach out to, that <laughs> first of all, they're available because the pandemic made everyone look at social media more. But second of all, you'd be surprised about people that opened up and just said, hey, this is what it's doing for me. You know, I can't see my elderly family member. And so we personally, um, it's, 
not fun to be, you know, I would love to be in front of Cafe Con and see the audience today. I would love to have breakfast with everyone and go to Oxford and do what we always do and meet people. But uh, during this pandemic, it's been a transition for me being, you know, being living by myself and, and I, you know, luckily my dad's not far away, but it's just, it's been, a, it's been unfortunate. But on the, on the plus side of it, I've been able to reach out to a lot more people and have more deeper, genuine conversations because they have more time. As we talk about networking and kind of getting back to our topic, how does a person enter this network of early childhood education? Let's say it's uh, a young parent. Uh, they, they're just, they're actually going to have an inf or give birth soon. Uh, how do they find uh, an appropriate center for a newborn baby? Well, we can, they can call our office at the Early Learning Coalition in Hillsborough County and we can, we can talk through them, talk, talk the options through them, but also just you know, in, in the in the areas they they're in, whatever neighborhood, whatever you know, there we know a lot of those folks, and we can connect them to the centers as well. Give this first parent some questions they should ask, or what should they be looking for in a center for the, a newborn baby? Um, I would say just just the the the. I mean, one of the things I always ask when I walk through is, you know, how long has the the teachers have they been moving around? And have they been there a long time, right? Because I think that sets up uh, longevity and continuity with, with, the, with the team. Also, the other thing is, you know, what is the, the daily routine? You know, is it more playtime? Is it more nap time? Is it, is, it more, is it more screen time? Because I know a lot of parents, sometimes they don't want screen time at such an early age. So I think those kind of questions to what I've, when I've visited is the things that the, the child care center headmasters and principals tell me. And back to the networking thing, I'll jump back to that for a second. You um, you also are very well networked among uh, political leaders, and you were appointed by Governor Scott, and 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 I think maybe you were reappointed by Governor DeSantis. Can you tell us about your uh, political network also? Yeah, I mean, I was reappointed by Governor Scott. It was two days after I lost my election for a county commissioner, and um, I was you know really fortunate that the governor reappointed me. I think. One of the other child advocates I want to give a shout out to on our board is Commissioner Merman, who's been a huge child advocate for Hillsborough County, whether it's the Glazer Museum, a children's board, and now, of course, the Early Learning Coalition. So I have, you know, I think a lot of the county commissioners have been supportive of the Early Learning Coalition. We do partner with the uh, with the um, uh, the Hillsborough the Board of County Commissioners for funding. I think that's important. So on the local level, it's really close to the the, the county commissioners on the school board. You've got uh, Stacy Hahn, who's early learning. Uh, doctorate herself, so she's a big advocate for us, as is Steve Kona and um, and Melissa Sively, and I think, and she's the chair, of course, and Superintendent Davis and even Superintendent Eakins have both been great partners in our school district. In fact, we have Tracy Brown from the school district. She's been on our board. She's the assistant superintendent. She's been on our board for the last four years, and um, I would say the local elected officials and even those superintendent, the, the, the big uh, public appointees, I think they all um, have seen the work we're doing at the Early Learning Coalition, Bill, and answer your question, I've been fortunate enough to create relationships because they want to be involved, and that's what we want to see from our public elected officials. You brought it up, and now I'm going to ask the question, what is your future political and aspirations? Yeah, my great, my great question, my, my, my goal right now is just to, to continue to do what I'm doing and lead this organization and, and take it to the next level. We already have done a little bit of that and, and grow my business. And, you know, if the opportunity pops up again, Maybe I'll do it. Bill's known me for a long time, Dell. You were there when I was running. It's, uh, it takes a lot out of you, but I'm glad that I did uh, put my name in the hat because I think one of the reasons I did decide to run for county commission is I think we need newer ideas um, from, from uh, people with different backgrounds. And my background is just very different and unique. And, and whether it's getting elected or serving in a position like this, I want to give back to the community that's given me so much. Tell us, um, you've written recently, and I think a couple years ago, uh, columns in the paper about millennials. Um, at the beginning of COVID-19, uh, you, you thought millennials were being unfairly criticized, maybe for things a different generation did. Um, you've got, I guess we've got three generations here. Del, you're probably a baby boomer. I'm Generation X. Akash is a millennial. And then uh, my kids are Generation Z, uh, although they're not here right now. Um, tell us, tell us where you think uh, millennials are now. Um, they're they're hitting a lot of them are hitting forty. What's changing with with millennials and and uh, and and how are they uh, stepping into leadership roles? 
well, first and foremost, they're becoming parents, right? So a lot of millennials now at this age are having kids later in life. And so I think that's different from our generation, from your, the generations you're talking about. And so they're, they've been suffering through this pandemic because they have childcare things and, and, and they're, you know, they're, they're great parents as another thing is they're also, you know, they're in the, they're in, they're in the hospital system. They're the first responders. And a lot of millennials are leading um, the efforts. And when they, we had testing sites up, they were out there volunteering. When there were protests or volunteering for cleaning, they were, um, so I think a lot of millennials are serving on boards more than ever. They're finding opportunities to give back. They're also making more money, I just believe, and have given that back. And are, they're starting organizations, whether it's, you know, whether it's the millennials that are talking about the, you know, the biking in Tampa or the walking in Tampa or the, or the Bayshore issue, or even just uh, helping the police department in their rise Tampa. And uh, Mayor Castor has a lot of millennials. In fact, she just appointed a millennial, and I think Tyler Hudson's a millennial to the heart board. So I, I would say that millennials, the reason I said that in the op-ed bill is that millennials want to be, they always wanted a seat at the table. Everyone knows that. But now they've had the chance to have the seat at the table and do something with it. And during the pandemic, uh, I think we were very, very uh, unfairly criticized for spreading the coronavirus when it was all sorts of folks that were um, that were doing that. And that's why I wrote that op-ed. And it really was a showcase that, you know, we're kind of the people that always get picked on. The number one video that went viral during this pandemic, if you remember, Bill, was in March. There was spring breakers in Miami. There was a CBS news video that said, there were some spring breakers that said, hey, I saved money all year. It's my college spring break and I'm gonna go to the beach when the state's shutting down. Well, th if they're in college, Bill, they're Gen Z, sorry. <laughs> Del, you wanna ask your last question? Well, I do wanna get back to early childhood education. Uh, are there facilities in the county that are open 24 hours a day because you do have some parents, nurses, um, first responders that work, you know, 24 hour shifts or work in the evenings or what have you. What is available for those parents? I don't know any off the top of my head that are 24 hours, but there are many after school programs. And I'm glad you brought up the first responder um, 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 issue, issue because essential workers during the pandemic, Delta, and back to your question about COVID 19. We did have many centers stay open because they're essential workers, and the state, uh, the state, the Office of Early Learning did um, did cover their costs, and so we did provide that for essential workers. But off the top of my head, I don't know any 24-hour childcare centers. That's not part of the matrix that you keep on. If a person calls you, and let's say it's a nurse, and uh, their shift is from 9 p.m. to 7 a.m., uh, how would they find a, a daycare center? Well we'll, 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 we'll connect them to one. I just don't know off the top of my head where they're located. Okay. But um, but I'm, give us the contact information. Sure. The website for the Early Learning Coalition of Ellsborough County is www.elchc.org. And then the website for Bosses for Babies, I would love for you guys to reach out regarding Bosses for Babies, is bossesforbabies.com. And uh, we're on Twitter. I'm, I'm on Twitter at Patel, P-A-T-E-L-T-I-M-E-S. And uh, my email address is Patel, P-A-T-E-L-T-I-M-E-S at gmail.com. And I would love to hear anyone's thoughts on early learning and how to get, if they want to get involved in Boston for Babies, if they, and, if, and, and if they believe the Hillsborough County is doing a great job, like I know we are in quality early learning experiences for everyone. Well, thank you so much, Akash. Um, thank you, uh, Dell, and thanks to uh, the Catholic on Tampa board. Thanks to everybody who's watching. If you're watching, please um, click the like button and hit the share button so your friends and family can see this. Akash, we, we, there's so many topics we could talk about and the 30 minutes goes by really fast. So uh, we'll have to have you back and, um, and you've offered to send us some folks from the Indo-US Chamber too. So let's make sure that we do that. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for what you're doing and uh, look forward to hearing from you soon. Happy to help, Bill. Dell, thank you so much for the opportunity.